Well, good morning. We'll be talking about family today. A word on family before we begin. Uh, it is very, very good to be back here with our family. We had an amazing vacation, but we were, I think I speak for all of us, we were very much looking forward to being back here, gathered together again, the people that love God and love us, and we, we certainly missed you all on our time away. And I'm also want to take just a moment, because I haven't had an opportunity yet, to say how excited and thankful I am for those two new members of our family, Chloe Brown being baptized at camp, and in the middle of our vacation, get a message from Sam about Micah, and that's just was such good news, made our vacation even that more greater to be able to rejoice 2,000 miles away and, and still be able to rejoice with, with that good news. So I am very, very thankful to be amongst our family again. This year, we've spent a lot of time talking about idolatry. And we've seen how the biblical principle of idolatry is when you worship something, you begin to take on the characteristics of what you worship. And the idea behind that is if we're worshiping God, we're going to radiate His glory. We're going to put on His characteristics, His nature. We're going to shine that into the world around us. But if we worship things other than God, we will radiate their glory. And the phrase that we see repeatedly throughout Scripture is the idea of vanity or profitlessness. Whenever we worship things that are less than God, we're worshiping something that is vain. It doesn't have the ability to save us, help us, strengthen us, lead us, and we will become vain, empty, profitless like those things. That's the idea of exchange. We are exchanging the glory of the Creator. Romans chapter 1.25, we're exchanging the glory of the Creator for something that is created, something that is less than and become empty and become vain. But what we're going to talk about today, as we've shifted on into this, this sort of uh, maybe an application series, um, how we're taking this message that we've seen, this principle that we've understood from the Bible, and we begin applying it to our lives. And we saw that that is something that is needed for the church. Last month, we talked about how the church can begin to idolize things that it should not idolize. But we also need to see that that is true for the family as well. And so we're going to be talking a little bit today and discussing how the family can become an idol. And what I want us to start off with is saying that while we might need to understand these terms of vain and profitlessness, we're not talking about worthlessness. We're not going to say that the things that we're talking about today are worthless, but we need to understand their worth in connection to God. And how we're going to do that is seen primarily how this idea of love, love for family, love for others, love can become an idol that strips us from what God truly offers in the way of love. And we need to be able to see that. That's going to be our main focus, how that is involved with the family. But we're going to begin somewhere a little bit further away from the family. Because when it comes to this concept of love, we need to understand from, a, a worldly, uh, from the world that we live in, that we struggle even how to apply that and, and receive that and, and to experience that. In many ways, people who are searching for love find it, or think they find it, through sexual immorality. And so that's where we're going to begin this morning, talking about sexual immorality. And the world we live in is saturated with sexual immorality. We've turned it into a business. And not only a business, a billion-dollar business. There was a report that was put out some, some years ago. I imagine this number is probably not accurate anymore. I imagine it's went up. But the uh, the sex industry is a 14 to 15 billion dollar revenue maker in the United States. And what was interesting is that report made you put the United States not at the top of the list. There are other countries that are bringing in even more money through this than, than even us. Our world is filled, saturated with this problem, with sexual immorality. But not only is it on a rise on this, we, we might look at that and think, okay, that's like the seedy underbelly of business 
here that we see that we might envision the things that we might come to mind when I'm talking about a 15 billion dollar business involving this but with the rise of social media something that stood out especially starting pro- just prior to covid and covid maybe exasperated this with with people not able to leave and people losing their jobs and something that happened was families began to see husbands and wives began to see that they could make revenue as well through engaging in maybe not sexual immorality between a husband and wife, but in allowing other people to have a desire for that. And so this is a huge, huge problem in the society that we live in. People recognize they can make money. People recognize they can have fame or or maybe more accurate, they can have notoriety. And it is shaping and changing the way that we understand the concept of love. Uh, we don't have to go far from our, <coughs> from our own circles of relationships. You know, maybe these things that I'm talking about, they, we feel shielded from them. We, we don't have any experience with that or we, we don't know anybody that's involved in that, but maybe we don't have to go very far from our, our, our circles of influence. We start finding things such as sex before marriage, and uh, th- this idea, a very common idea today is that, you know, we just, we're not going to get married at all. We'll just live together and be happy to just enjoy this life and, and not put any sort of labels on things, right? Over and over again, we find people in this quest to have some sort of tangible love. You know, I want to feel loved, I want to give love, I want love. And in the quest for this, it is more and more often leading people to sexual immorality. Why is that? And what does God think about that? If you want to open your Bibles, mine are open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 at the moment. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. And I want us to listen very carefully here to what the Apostle Paul has to say. When he speaks about this, when he speaks about this idea of sexual immorality and God's mind towards it and what he thinks about it, I want you to think, listen very carefully. Focus on the words that he chooses to use. Let's start in verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, That you excel still more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. Your sanctification. That is, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, Paul, when he, when he is inspired by the Spirit in writing these words to the church in Thessalonica, says, Brethren, we are to abstain from sexual immorality. We are to keep away from it. We are to refrain from it. We are to have no part in that. And in fact, he goes on to say, you are to have control. And so he, he is illustrating that the problem with sexual immorality is not really a problem with, with love. It's a problem with control. You are to have control over your vessel. You are to have control over our bodies. The ESV says to do that in holiness. New American Standard said to do that with sanctification instead of allowing lustful passions to control us. So he's, he's giving us, there, there's something happening here with this problem of sexual immorality. That is either you are you are controlling yourself or something is controlling you. Either holiness, you're controlling yourself in holiness, or lustful passions are controlling you. And consider verse 8. I think, I think it's important to see that disregarding this as, well, that's old-fashioned. It's not a big a deal it's, 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 not, it's not really that, that dangerous a problem. That's just your opinion. 
Verse 8, he says, disregarding this isn't disregarding the teaching of the church or the writing of an apostle or, or what the preacher says on Sunday. Disregarding this is disregarding the commandments of God. He began that, and he, he really took this one section and he just bookends it. He sandwiches it. He says, at the beginning, we commanded you with the authority of Jesus Christ. And then we talked to you about controlling yourself and abstaining from sexual immorality. And then he... <coughs> Excuse me. And then he wraps it back up and says, disregard that. You're not just disregarding me, you're disregarding God. This is God's commandment. This is God's mind on this. So we might word that another way. We might say that if I can't do that, or if I won't do that, abstain from sexual immorality, if I won't control myself, I can't stop myself from looking at things on computers and having sexual relations with those that are not my spouse, I need to see idolatry. I need to see that there's something there that I, I am not becoming more like my God. I'm becoming more like something else. I need to see the danger of idolatry within that. I'm worshiping, maybe it's an idol, just the idol of pleasure. And I, I enjoy the way that I feel. I need to recognize the profitlessness of that. It doesn't lead to love. It leads to ob objectification. It leads to treating others as, as objects, treating others as, as just tools, an ends to a mean. It makes me and my relationships vain. The main focus, <clears throat> excuse me, We need to see, we need to see the, the profitlessness of that. Now, I want you to remember something else. Exodus chapter 32. If you go back in your minds there, that's the, the Israelites and the golden calf incident. They've, went up to, they've, they've come to Mount Sinai. Moses has gone up on the mountain. God has come down and is, is giving him this, the, the Ten Commandments. He's created a covenant with them. There is, in the sense, a marriage at Sinai. You remember the elders go up and eat a meal, and, and it's, you know, I think we a lot of times think about Sinai as just Moses and God. This was Moses and Israel. And then in the middle of giving these covenant agreements, these lines that this is what the covenant is built on, Israel creates the golden calf. Now in Exodus 32 and in verse 6, there is something specific that is said about the relationship. Of, of God and His holiness as connect, or in, in maybe contrast to, to Israel and how they're living. <clears throat> Exodus 32 and in verse 6, they've made this, this uh, golden calf. Verse 4, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up <clears throat> from the land of Egypt. And then they proclaim a feast the next day. So it says in verse 6, the next day they rose early and they offered burnt offerings. <laughs> Tell you what, my voice. You would think a week away is going to fix this. But it's not. <coughs> Excuse me. It says the next day they rose up, they offered burnt offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink. And they rose up to play. Now maybe you've read that. And you always just thought that was kind of a weird thing. Made a golden calf. Had a feast, got together and played Parcheesi. Like, what, what are we doing here? I want to suggest that what's happening here is not, you know, the, the, we had the, the co ed softball game. This is not the, the first annual, let's get together and, and, and drink some Cokes and play a Hebrew softball game together. There was something much more dark and much more sinister happening at the foot of Mount Sinai. And I think if you read some of your other translations, the NIV, for example, says that they, instead of rose to, they ate and drank and rose to play, said that they ate and drank and were involved in revelry. And they're trying to softly suggest that something, something worse than just a good time is happening here. The, uh, the CEV, <clears throat> the Contemporary English Version, says that they behaved like wild people. 
And some of your other translations will be even a little bit more on the nose. In fact, if you really start digging into the, the commentaries on this, you'll find very quickly the language is just language that's not suitable really for a congregational setting. There was some wickedness going on at the foot of Mount Sinai. And to make that a little bit more clear, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And look at what Paul says about them there in verse 7 and verse 8. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play, nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. The ESV, I, I think... I think specifically with this word immorally does a better job across the board whenever it is used because the word there, the Greek word pornea, it was sexual immorality that he is referencing there. It gives us an idea of what was going on at this time. Worshiping the idols of passion and pleasure might seem like it brings something good with it. Here is our God. We are worshiping Him and, and this is what it has led to. And what happens? Paul says a large number of them are wiped out by God. God's wrath is poured out. 23,000, I think it said. 23,000 die. It is unacceptable to God. Whenever we set the, the pursuit of, of our passions up in front of Him. And again, not worthless. Please let me reiterate that. Sexual immorality describes the pursuit of passion apart from God. God is not set above it as the God of, of creation, as holy, holy, holy as we sing. God is not set above it. And that is what makes it vain and, worth, and profitless. We must understand, we must see that His wrath is towards such things in Scripture. We also need to see that we oftentimes seek out love and try to have our needs met in other ways. Primarily, what we're going to look at is marriage. And you might think to yourself, how could marriage become an idol? This is something that God instituted. This is something that, that God has made. Marriage should be inherently a good thing. But I want you to think about how marriage is portrayed in the society that we are in today. It is almost always portrayed as a means to an end. Maybe I want romance. I want someone who will complete me. I want the one. It seems to be Hollywood's take on it. But how often do we talk to, to people from failed and broken marriages who will say that Mr. or Miss Perfect that put on this Maybe this facade, they, they, they lived this way when we were dating, but once we got married, their, their true self came out. And they just failed and fell so far below the expectations that we had. And it's just that, these expectations, some oftentimes unreasonable expectations at that, that lead to marriages that crumble and, and end in divorce. And they're filled, the, the ones that, that just stay together are filled with selfishness and people who are looking for someone who does something for them. And I want to suggest that the problem in those situations, we might struggle to see it or not, and it might be a bit of a, a step, the problem in that situation is idolatry. Because we are looking for something that we can trust in, rely in, be completed or fixed by. And the problem is the thing that we're looking for to, to fill the hole that's in us, the thing that we're looking for that somehow is going to, to make our problems better is broken itself. We're looking to something that is just as sinful and broken as us and saying, you're the one. Fix me. Complete me. Fill me. And I hope we begin to see, thinking about it that way, the, the way that it's likened to idolatry. Let's think of a Bible example of this. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 3. Think of Solomon. You think of Solomon? He's one of the wisest men to ever live, wisest king. 1 Kings eleven three 3 reveals that he has seven, 700 wives and 300 concubines. 
Not really good at math, but I can put those numbers together. It's a thousand. A thousand women for Solomon. And you might argue, because at this time, Solomon expands the borders of the kingdom to the largest that they are ever going to be in the nation of Israel. You might argue that this is done politically. He is making treaties. He's building relationships with other nations, and that's why he's doing all this. But in the Song of Solomon, we reveal a little bit more of his character, of his nature. And it tells us that the king was looking for something. I want you to think about this. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verses 8, through the, just the first part of verse 9. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and maidens without number. But my dove, my perfect one, is unique. She is her mother's only daughter. She is the pure child of the one who bore her. Now, at this point, Solomon says, I've got 140 women. Not counting the Shulamite woman, how you want to see this work out. It's 860 more to go to get to 1,000. Solomon is looking at this one and says, this one is the one for me. Going to wind up with 1,000. We're only at 140. This one is the one. Now, I don't want to take away or discredit the value of this book. It is, there, there, there is a greater meaning than what we're just taking from this one passage of, of love and of, of, of dating. And I think, I think especially the analogy of God and Jesus and His love for you in the book of Song of Solomon. But please see one of the wisest man ever. Not even starting on his journey to a thousand. He says, this is the one for me. We look to our marriages to be that, that hope and satisfaction that fills us. We turn our reliance away from God and we look, look to this person and say, I, I need you to be that, that rock, that strength, that help. We're expecting more of our spouses than they can ever truly offer. And that is going, they are going to fail us. But relying on God, we'll see that marriage was never about finding someone to do that. How did God talk about marriage? It was never about finding someone that's going to fix all of your problems, that's going to be that person that gives you everything that you wanted. Marriage was always about finding that person that you're going to give yourself to. Now, as we get further into Ephesians chapter 5 and our study of that book, we're going to see that. But I want you to consider just a precursory, consider how Paul describes marriage there. And he describes it repeatedly as giving. Wives, submit to your husbands. Your wives are giving themselves in submission to the husband. Husband, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Sacrificially, husbands, you give yourselves to your wives and sacrifice for them. Over and over again, we see this picture that God's design for marriage is about giving. And so when we view our marriage with selfish expectations, we need to consider how that can become an idol and how that will, will change us and shape us and how our marriages will wind up not radiating the glory of God to the world around us until we draw them in line, putting God at the first. Another one to consider is how our children can become idols. First off, I think maybe sometimes the thinking is that children is going to equal greater love in my marriage. And maybe, maybe you've seen that in, in cases, the situation where a husband and wife and they're not going, uh, things aren't going very well and she just feels like, I, you know, he, he's, he's not happy with me or may, maybe he feels like she's not really wanting to, to spend very much time at home. And that is, you know, if we just introduce a child in this, it's going to fix everything. That's what we really need. And so we, we have a child that doesn't fix the problem. And I think there's biblical examples of this as well. You, Genesis 29 and Genesis 30, it is, like, it is like I'm going to get your attention, Jacob. This is the picture of Jacob and Leah and Rachel. I'm going to get your attention, Jacob. If you don't love me, I'll give you a baby. 
Well, I gave you this many babies. I want to give you a baby too. And it's just this concept of, of all of these, these children are being born almost as if they're vying for the affection of their husband through their offspring. But I think that's not the common way that we see children becoming an idol. I think more common is the seeking this idea of, of love again or self-worth which is directed towards our children. Maybe I'm in a marriage where my spouse doesn't provide the satisfaction that I'm, I'm looking for. And in turn, I seek that through our, our children. So instead of wives submitting to husbands or husbands sacrificing themselves for their wives, they, you see situations where parents just bury all of their attention and all of their devotion and all their focus into their children. And it's, it's a struggle because we understand that our children are very, very important. And we understand that we have a great responsibility as parents. And we've talked about that not too long ago. We have a great responsibility as parents. The responsibility first lied in the covenant that we made with our spouse. Sometimes we raise our children up higher than what God has has called for us. And what happens is, is we, we raise children, instead of raising them, instead of them growing up and learning how to, to live independently and, and function in society, maybe we coddle them, uh, may, maybe we, we spend time uh, not, not helping them develop the relationship that they need to have to go out and, and to, to, to start their own life and to build their own relationships. And there's this kind of quasi-marriage that is formed. And I, I I'm not, don't want to use terms like daddy's girl or, or mama's boy, but you, you've, you've maybe witnessed that when there's a, a relationship, you have a, a new husband and wife and, and everything that it, we can't make our decisions. I have to go and ask mom and dad if they agree with that. And the Bible talks about that too, doesn't it? Back in Genesis chapter 2 and the idea of leaving and cleaving. Uh, I think it's one of the more uncomfortable things for me to think about how my children might become an idol that I worship and serve over top of God. But it's worthwhile to think about because the Bible gives us an example of, well, of where that can lead. Maybe if you consider the, the, the picture of Eli who doesn't restrain his sons, seems to allow them to do whatever they want to do, and they grow up to be men who are struck down by God because of their wickedness. Or you might think of Rebecca and Jacob and Esau, and how she favored Jacob over Esau, and all of the problems in that family that came from, from parents that were really raising their children up to a place that did not belong. When we do that, we set our children up as idols. We set them up to fall. We put a load of bearing that they, they can't bear, and they will be crushed under those expectations. Or they will grow to resent us for putting them in that position. We need to be recognizing of that as well. But finally, I want us to talk about family. That's what we're wanting to talk about is idolatry and the family. So let's talk about that. In our scripture reading, uh, Jackson read for us Matthew chapter 10. I want to focus on just verse 37 for a moment. It says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And I think we're, we're drawn to Matthew's account of that. Because we like the language better than the counterpart, which is Luke 14. Verses 26 through 27, when it says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and child and brother and sister, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And admittedly, that is a difficult and worrisome passage. And so I think a lot of times we try to water it down a little bit. Because again, we like the Matthew 10 language better. And so we'll say, well, when he says hate, he means love less. And yes, 
If you hate something, you love it less than what you love. That is true statement. But you go back and look at all the times that God uses the word hate, especially specifically the, the Greek word that he uses here, such as you follow me and the world is going to love you less. The world is going to hate you. And I think you, see a, you begin to see a pattern that when God said hate, he, if you don't hate your father and mother, if you don't hate your, your, your son or daughter or child or own life, you cannot be my disciple. He knew what he was talking about. And he said what he meant to say. And so I think instead of trying and trying to make God's words more comfortable to our ears, we would do better to get more comfortable with his word. We do need to understand that he's talking about degrees. And we're going we're gonna to see a picture of this in a moment. But let us start off from the beginning. God said what he said and he meant it. How does my life mold into that? Many put family before God. Family comes to visit. Well, they're not here very often. We're not going to be at worship tonight. We're going to be spend time with our family. We're on a family vacation. You know, yes, we would normally go on go, go to worship, and we would go and 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 worship God on Sundays, but. We're here with our family. We're, we're in this. We don't get to do this very often. Let's, we're just not going to do it this time. Or you think about our children. Part of that family. Our, our children, uh, they, they have interests. They have things that they want to do. They have things that they're involved in. Their happiness has to come first. Guys, these things that I'm talking about. Children, that, that they need more sleep. Or they, have a, a, they had a really important ball game. Or there was a, a really big test on Monday. These are things that I've been told. I'm not just making those up. And so because of those things, we don't bring them to worship. Or we bring them to worship, but instead of training them to, to praise and, and, and learn about God, we, we bring them and we just kind of let them, we want to appease them and entertain them, make sure that, that they're happy. I watched a young man grow to be a big man. And every Sunday, every Sunday he had a, he had a game, he had something that he was playing with, something that was keeping his attention. And then as a full-grown man, one day I, I got up to go to the restroom and I walk into the bathroom and I could hear his video game that he was playing in the bathroom. What are we doing? What are we doing when we allow such things? What are we doing when we set such examples? What are we doing when we choose to, to set aside God's commands to gather together, to remember the death of His Son, to train up our children in the way they should go, and to, to nurture them, but also to provide admonition and warning. What are we doing when we set our family above such things? It is profitless. It will lead to being profitless. Now we could look all day long at people who did that in the Bible. And you know what? We're going to find names like Eli and Rebecca. We're also going to find names like David and Jacob. But what I want to give you is an example of someone who didn't do that. An example of someone who said, nothing is coming before my God. And that's found in Genesis chapter 22. And you might remember Genesis 22 is one of the very difficult passages to read because it's the passage where God, after waiting, making Abraham wait so very long to have a child, says, Abraham, I want you to go and I want you to kill your son. I want you to take him to a place that I will choose and I want you to sacrifice him to me. And Abraham gets up the very next morning and he gets the firewood and he gets his son and he gets some men to help them and off on this journey they go. And Genesis chapter 22 and in verse 12 is the moment where Abraham has taken his son and he has bound him and laid him on the altar and he has pulled his knife out to do exactly what God has told him to do. And God stops him. 
and says, do not stretch out your hand against the lad. Do nothing to him, for I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Family doesn't come first. And I think if you, were, if, if you are on a mountain and you look over and you see this guy getting ready to kill his son, you know what you say? That guy hates his son. But we know the story. We know that nothing could be further from the truth. Abraham had, had desired this son for so long. And he had, he had struggled with this and warred with this. God, how are you going to make it happen? The days are slipping away. I'm afraid it's never going to happen. Do you want it? Is, is it going to come through, through a descendant? Do you want me to do it this way? How is this going to happen? And finally, God has given him his son, his only true son between him and Sarah, Jacob, Jacob Abraham. Abraham loved his son. But in comparison to his love for God, yeah, that could be described as hate. Because God was that much higher. Abraham is a beautiful image of what Luke 14 is talking about. And God says, if you don't hate your family, even yourself more than me, we're talking about a sense of degrees. We're talking about relationship. The love that you have for your family is important. It's not worthless. It has great meaning. It can never be above the love that we have for our God who has given us this family, who has blessed us with it, who is directing it, who promises to save it. Family does not come first. God does. When we focus on God, only then will we act and live properly towards our children and towards our spouses and towards the relationships we have with others in the world. And a whole lot of this is bound up, I, I believe, in this, this striving to find something true. True love or true value. My true identity. And so sex and marriage and children and family, Satan will take those things and he will use them and say, this, I promise you, this is where that can be found. You don't need to do it this way. You don't have to go through the sacrifice of giving yourself. You don't have to, to do it that way. You can get it apart from God. But anything found outside of God fails. And so consider how God says it, as opposed to what Satan is, is whispering and preaching to us. Consider the words of God in Colossians chapter 3. If you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the, <clears throat> keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on earth. For if you have died... Excuse me. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Your identity is not found in who you're dating. Your identity is not tied up in the, the splendor of your spouse, the, the perfectness of your children. These things cannot satisfy us. These things will always eventually fail us. They will hurt us. They will say things that, that they may not mean, but they, they will fall short of being able to provide what we, what we need. True love can only be found in a life hidden in Christ. Allowing Him to be our identity. Allowing Him to be our life. Only then will we find satisfaction. Only then will we find value. And only then will we find love. So as we close, I just ask you to consider, don't exchange what God offers for something less.
Can we help you today in being buried with Christ through baptism? Being raised to find a new life, a life that is hidden in Christ, a life that is filled with glory, glory that will be revealed with the coming of Christ as He comes to be victorious over His enemies, to take us home, to be together with Him forever. If we can assist you with that this morning, that would be our greatest desire. Come forward and we'll talk about it together as we stand and sing.